I'm alive uh -huh. Feeling good, yeah. alright And you can take yeah. my joy Cause the world no. didn't give it to me You can take my joy Cause the world no. didn't give it to me no. I'm free, Come on. I'm alive, I'm alive. Feeling good, Feeling good. alright You can take my joy It's really neat to see that Jesus Christ really is He is the same today, yesterday, and forever That's right. the, there's, there's nothing about Jesus that has changed Except for one thing you know what that is? His location. There you go. He now lives inside of you, inside of me. He's just got more bodies to manifest His compassion, His grace, and His power to. That's really good news. If you belong to Jesus, He belongs to you. And He's not shy about, about who He is. He's not shy about being awesome through you. And so I want to let you know that God, a lot of times people, uh, even Christians, they they have a difficult start. You know, there's a reason that we came to realize we needed a Savior. <laughs> and sometimes we didn't just learn it from the Word. We learned it from the school of hard knocks. After beating our head up against the wall of life, for about, uh, you know, umpteen years, we finally figure out, you know what? With me in charge, it ain't going so well. <laughs> Maybe there's something to the fact that there's a God who created me, a God who knows what's best for me, a God who is good. He's not the ogre that, uh, that I thought maybe he was. He's not trying to control me. If he wanted to control me, he'd, he'd already took me out. Maybe he's been the one the whole time who's been extending the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth chance. Maybe he's been the one who's continued to reach out to bring me home and to bring me into that thing that I've been looking for. I keep looking for it my way, but I'm not finding it. I'm putting things in my body to make me feel peaceful. Because I don't have peace inside of me. But you know what? Jesus Christ said, My peace I give to you. I've been putting things in my body to try to make me feel happy. Maybe I need to feel happy because I don't have joy. But Jesus said, My joy I give to you and no man can take your joy from me. I've been trying to find my joy in a bunch of relationships with other people, with guys or with girls. Or with both. And you know what? They let us down. There's as much grief as there is joy, isn't there? But you know what? When you're trying to find your joy and your happiness from someone else, they can take it from you. If you're looking for, you know, hey, please give me, give me, give me. They might give me, give me, give me for a little bit. You know, the first one's always free. But then comes the price to pay. Now the expectations come. Okay, I'm giving you some happiness. How about you give me a little happiness? And then all of a sudden the fight turns out because you realize you not only are, are you trying to get joy from them, they're trying to get joy from you, and you are both empty. And it takes you just a little while to figure that out. And how about we plug back into God and let the fullness of God fill our hearts because you can't empty God. He, you can't draw. You can't drink the ocean dry. You really can't. God's joy is overflowing, and He created us to want joy. He created us to want peace. He created us to want truth. He created us to be awesome. It's not bad to want to feel the way you feel, to feel respected, to feel appreciated, to feel like you've got something to offer. That's a good feeling, isn't it? God made us to want to feel that way. But there's illegitimate ways that we try to get that that are destructive. And there's ways to walk in that that are so powerful, so meaningful. I, I really enjoyed carrying Jesus to Cambodia. I really enjoy carrying Jesus to y'all. I like it when y'all are blessed because I know 
it's not me that you like. It's the Jesus that comes out of me in the words and in the ministry. And you know what? He's not partial. He's not particular. He didn't say, hey, I really have this thing for balding uh, middle-aged men. <laughs> or old bald men. <laughs> I like your hair now, brother. Me and you are like twins. I can look in the mirror. This is what I'm going to look like when I get to be 50. <laughs> So, uh, he's not playing favorites. God, do you understand that? That, that? that he died for everyone. He, he, you know, it's like a parent. If you've got more than one child, I can love all of my children with all that's in me. I don't have to divide up my love. I've got three children. And I didn't have to like give one a third of my love and another another third, another another third. I love all three of them with all that's in me. The only thing that limits me is my energy. <laughs> okay? That's all that limits me. But how much energy does God have? The other thing that limits me is my ability to be one place at a time. I have to be one place at a time. I can't be three places at a time. You know what? God is everywhere. He can love you with all that's in Him. With no reserves. He's got His eye on you. He's not divided in His attention. He's got His eye on you. He's counted all the hairs on your head. And He got done with mine quicker than yours. <laughs> But he moved on to other things with me. Okay? And that's good to know that God is that personal. That He's that good. That He's that loving. Y'all, every one of us have had a different road coming into where, where tonight is. Some of us were raised in good homes. And we went the wrong direction because of rebellion or uh, or whatever outside influence has got in here. Some of us were raised in real bad homes where mom and dad just soon ignore you or slap you or cuss at you than to, to say something kind about you. Okay? But you know what? Our, as much as our environments may affect us, I just want to let you know Tonight, I want to, this week, I really want to emphasize something. So I'm going to anchor a lot of my messages in this. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. Passed gone, passed away, depending on translation. I like to say gone. You know, because sometimes passed away is like a southern euphemism. They, they passed away. You know, but I like to say, it's gone. It's out of here. The old is gone. The new has come. Now listen, if any man is where? In, in Christ. 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 Any man. How many any mans we got in here? Anyone. That's a man or a woman man. And that's one of them biblical any mans. Any person. If anyone's in Christ. So you know what? There's something really important here. If you look at the at the creation story in Genesis chapter one, you see some you see a pattern. You know, God creates the heavens and the earth, and then He uh, separates the the air from the from the, the you know the, the the sky above and the waters beneath. Then He separates the water from the land, and then he creates the heaven dwellers, the stars and the moon. He fills the heavens. Then he creates uh, the, the uh, things to, to live in the land, the, the grass and the bushes and the trees. Then he creates little fishes to live in the water. Then he creates what? The, the birds and the, 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 and then he creates creeping things, cattle, and all that kind of stuff. And then he plants a garden. And then he creates man. There's a pattern here. I just want to bring that out. He creates the habitats. Then he puts 
the, the suitable habitat, then he puts the creation into the habitat. First is the habitat, then is the creation for that habitat. <clears throat> you understand that? Pretty, pretty basic sort of thing. I mean, it makes sense, right? You don't get fish and then let them flop on a on a table for a little while while you while you get the tank ready. <laughs> you get the tank ready, then you put the fish in the tank. It just that's the way it's got to be done. He created a garden and he put man into that garden. And we see something about the garden that it was a perfect place for man to dwell. He had everything that he needed. He had the fellowship of God. He didn't have, uh, he, may, he had a wife. He had all the food that he needed to eat. He had light. He had air. And he still made the wrong decision because there was one thing that man was created, that, uh, uh, a habitat for man, that we were lacking. We were lacking what was in that tree of life. We had fellowship with God on the outside. We didn't have to, we didn't have to lose that fellowship. That clothed us. That covered us. It was like an armor about us. But then we went off. And instead of listening to God, we went our own way. We did our own thing. And boom, man. Now we got a physical habitat about us. But man, emotionally for our soul, mentally, it's like craziness out there, isn't it? And the craziness out there becomes craziness and difficulty in here. And it can get yucky. But where did God predestine us to be? To dwell. Okay? In Ephesians it said that He, he predestined us to be adopted in Christ. Over and over we see this word, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. You understand that before the foundations of the world, there was no physical creation. There were no heavens, no earth, no nothing. There wasn't even a great expanse out there somewhere. There was only God. And so God decided he what was he doing there was the father and the son and they were fellowshipping in one another the son was in the father by the spirit the father was in the son by the spirit don't ask me to explain it it's just what's revealed in the word it's amazing Jesus talks about that. In John 17, He said, Father, glorify Me with the glory I had with You before the foundations of the world. As a man, He had touched something in the eternals through His Father. And He had this revelation of, man, I was in You glorious before the foundations of the world. You know what? When the Father created human beings, when He created you, he has a perfect place for you to dwell. He's just loving his son. He's like, you know, have you ever like really loved somebody? Not like wanted from, but like you're totally not only attracted to them, but you're totally, I would give myself completely for you. You are so worth everything that's within me. And the Father, and this is without reserve. I mean, you can get hurt loving people like that. Because sometimes people ain't ready for that kind of trust. Um, not outside of a marriage covenant. Not outside of a family relationship. But I'll tell you what. When the Father loves the Son. Twice in Jesus' earthly life, we, God ripped open the heavens so that we could hear with our ears what the Son has been having going on inside of Him from before the foundations of the world and now for at least 30 years and He's enjoying this as a human being. God rips open the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Can you imagine that? Having inside of you Almighty God just pouring out love of, of knowing you're so lovely. You're so my son. You're so my daughter. I'm so pleased with you. I delight in you. 
I give myself fully to you. I got your back. I want everybody to listen to you. You got something to offer the world. Isn't that? I mean, that's awesome. That's what the Son is. And you know what? God predestined that you would be inside that. That that would be what you're plugged into. Like a Christmas light. You know, you got electricity going into the to the light, and the light's going into the light. You're like, I want you to be in that. I, that's what I predestined you, that you would be hooked up. The next light, the next light, the next light, and the same powerful love that's going into the first one. Hey, let's just hook them up. Let's just hook them up. Well, how do we do this? That's where the cross, that's where the incarnation comes in. You've got to be... You've got to take on their humanity. You've got to become one with them. The Son says, I'll do it. You've got to become their sin on the cross. He did it. So that you can rise again from the dead and break off all this stuff that came on them and came into them. So that I can pour out my spirit and become one with them on the inside. You know, this isn't God telling you try harder, try harder, try harder. If I took a fish and put it on the middle of the floor, it's going to flop around, you know, maybe for a couple hours. Eventually it's going to get tired, it'll die before the end of the night. Would you think that that fish is a terrible fish, just a bad fish, or would you think you're stupid? You got in the wrong environment. Right? We, you know, you can take an alligator and uh, take him up to the top of Mount Everest and he's not going to do so well. You put him in the Nile River, now you got something. Because you've got him in the right environment. Listen, you were kidnapped. You were taken captive. You were born in captivity in the domain of darkness. Right. You were not born in the environment that God created you to need as a human being. That's why, out of like a fish flopping around, desperately trying to get what they feel biologically, I've got to have something different than a cold floor to flop around onto. You might flop some ridiculous places. Where have you flopped? <laughs> right? But you know what? When all when the hand of Almighty God reaches you, reaches down, puts you in the little bucket, and then carries you out to the lake and throws you in, that's different. Hey, now we got something. That's what it is to be born again. Because God Almighty takes you out of the domain of darkness and places you into the kingdom of the beloved Son. That's Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. We need that, don't we? We need that. So this week, really what I'm going to be, be, be emphasizing is how, what is, what is, I want you to come into the experience that you know that you are living inside of Jesus Christ. That's good. And that He is living inside of you. Because we don't want just to uh, believe on Jesus Christ so that I go to heaven when I die and meanwhile I try to use the Bible to straighten myself out while I'm down here. Hoping I can finally stop doing all those things I really enjoy doing <laughs> that are messing my life up. You, we really need Jesus to give us His heart. We really need to give our hearts, our minds, our lives to Him so that He can take the old completely out and so that He can pour His self into us. But I want to let you know something. You see this pattern of God creating a habitation and then putting things to habitate it. 
you need to understand that not only is Jesus Christ our habitation so that we can live in God, through Jesus Christ, we have become God's habitation so that He can live in the visible realm and make Himself visibly displayed. Put His power, His grace, His life on display in and through us. That's what God created us to be. That's what He saved you to do and to experience and to know. That's why Jesus didn't just, as soon as you believed on Him, Say, Zach, let's get you into the heavens. If you ever wonder, gosh, you know, why do I have to go through this? Why, you know, why don't you just, why don't you just take me out so I can just be with you forever? It's so hard, and blah blah blah. blah, blah you, know, I, you know, you know why I can do that so good? <laughs> it's not because I've been listening to y'all. <laughs> it's because I remember what it was like before I discovered. How to live in Jesus and how He lives in us and how that's real and that's not just some theoretical thing so that you can have good self-esteem using Bible verses. Okay? It's real. It's really how God sees things. Let me start out just to let you know. Remember how I told you there was no great expanse out there. There was no out there. There were no angels. There was nothing. There was no invisible creation. There was no visible creation. There was simply God. And God was all. He was the all. And so the Word of God says that He created all things in Christ. He put the creation in Christ. That is... Amazing to me. He created the heavens, the invisibles. And He moved into the heavens. I don't understand that. Don't ask me. So that He would be locatable. Then He created the visibles. And there was one being in the visible realm that was going to be this unique being it would be like a bridge or a doorway or a portal between the two realms. It was this being that was like, let us make man in our image. So that God would have an image bearer on the earth. That there would be someone in the creation that God, when they say, what does the invisible God look like? How does He act like? What does He think? What does He do? They'd say, like that one. See the life coming out of them. See the love coming out of them. See the peace that's in them. See the joy that's in them. That's what we were created. We were created to contain God's life. That's why when you're born without it, you're empty. And you flop around trying to fill this emptiness inside of you. You were created to need love. That's why you've been looking for it so much. You were created to need approval. You were created to need comfort. That's why the God who is love is what you need. That's why the Holy Spirit is the comforter. Because you need God. You need to contain Him. He is your comforter. You don't have to become comfortably numb. You can be comforted alive with the life of God. You can be fully alive in the midst of every difficulty. And instead of needing to, uh, to find an escape, you can find Him in the midst of that, being everything that you need. Is that okay if I, if I shoot real straight with you guys? I hope you understand. I'm not just up here popping off. I want you to... to really get this at a practical level. We all are looking for stuff and the desires of your heart, the hardwiring, your, your, your infrastructure of the things that you're searching after, those are embedded in you. They are not wrong. But where, where unbelief and darkness 
has made you go with those desires, that's where the deception, that's where the darkness has come. And if we can learn that everything, every desire of our heart, the Word of God says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. You, he's what we've been looking for the whole time. We've been looking for an attaboy from a father. Some, some father that instead of with all his strength, with all his knowledge, looking down his nose and kicking us in the butt and telling us how we're not like him and wish we would do better and you are never going to be anything, look at you and say, look, with all my wisdom, with all my strength, you're my boy. And if you didn't get it right, do it again. I'll help you this time. Do it again. You'll never lose my approval. You'll never lose my help. With all my strength, I'm here to help you, not measure you and then condemn you. That's good news, isn't it? It really is. Because you know what? We were all born in an environment. But the environment that God brought us into, the environment that we need, is to live in Christ. We need to live inside someone else and to get love that someone else bought for us, that someone else who we can't screw up, that we're just able to participate. Kind of like when you were a baby in your mom's womb. You know, you didn't have any worries, did you? You, didn't, you had a roof over your head. You know, you got to eat. If she ate, you ate. If she was loved, you were loved. If she was well taken care of, you were well taken care of. You got everything. You were a freeloader and you enjoyed it. <laughs> so was I. You got to you got to get come into this realm inside of someone else. So everything that was hers was yours. What'd you do to earn that? You didn't do a darn thing, did you? You just showed up. And so many of us are used to having to earn everything that we don't understand how profound it is that God didn't create Adam to have to earn a place. He, God went and walked and talked with Adam. And even after Adam had eaten off the wrong tree, God still showed up to walk and talk. God was not the one hiding. It was Adam. Wasn't it? It was Adam who was the one running away. He was the one who said, God's not going to love me. Where did that come from? Did it come from... That's right, it came from the snake. Good job, young lady. You got it right. It didn't come from God, did it? No, because God, God said, hey, why were you hiding? Adam said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And God looked at Adam and said, who told you you were naked? Did God, was that God's assessment of Adam? No. God didn't say that. Adam said, I feel uncovered. I feel unworthy. I feel like... Like, if you're going to look at me and you're going to, you know how people feel when they're getting stared at naked in public. That's just terrible. You feel absolutely humiliated. But that was not the way God was looking at him. Who told you that? He said, Well, I ate off the fruit and uh, our eyes were opened and we saw. That we were naked. Whoa, wait a second. You mean you were walking around with your eyes closed? You know? My eyes were open? What does that mean? Adam, you can imagine Adam and Eve, you know, walking around the garden with them long sticks and Ray Charles sunglasses. Is that what was going on? And they found a fruit. Hey, I can see! Throw the stick away! Was that what he meant? No. Do you hear what he said? Our eyes were open and we knew we were naked. See, before Adam and Eve didn't know anything except God. They, they knew everything through the relationship that they had. 
They were in Christ in a way. Not in the same way that we are, but in a way. They were in Christ, so they related to everything through Him. Lord, what, do you understand that? So God shared His knowledge, His perspective on everything. This is your wife. Didn't she glorious? Woo! God, you done good. Right? And don't tell me that they weren't naked in the way that husband and wife get naked and then all of a sudden now all their clothes dropped off when they ate the fruit. It's that they saw one another as complete, as perfect, as wonderful, as clothed with glory. They knew one another through Christ. So God was sharing His own perspective with them. But when they ate off the fruit... How did they do that? The serpent came in and said, Hey, look at this. Doesn't it look like it'll make you wise? So they, they used their own physical perception, their body, five senses, and their own reasoning ability to conclude something. Hey, let's try it. Then they came captive to that. Now, what you see is what you get. What I, and so we make our own judgments based on our own life experience. And you know what the Bible calls that? The domain of darkness. I look at her. She looks naked. She looks at me. I look naked. Meaning, I don't look glorious anymore. I used to look covered in glory. Now it looks like I look like something that needs covering up. <laughs> to her and she looks like something go cover that thing <laughs> you know and so you don't want to go before God feeling like who's going to cover me You know what God's answer has always been from before the foundations of the world? I will cover you. We are clothed in Christ. We're he says, take the best robe and put it on my son. Isn't that good? We return home saying, I'm un unworthy. Just take me back. I'll do what you want me to do. Just let me eat. Right? <laughs> And, and, you know, people do that. They say, God, I'll do anything. Just help me pay my bills. God, I'll do anything. Please just heal so and so. God, I'll do anything. Please don't let my wife. And he said, no, I, that ain't, that's not what I brought you home for. I got my son back. I got, I got the one that I love and I've been longing for. God created you for love. He created you to enjoy a relationship together. And it's not that you might not work in the field, but you will not work in the field as a slave. You will work in the field as an owner. Yeah. That's with right. your daddy. That's right. He didn't say, hey, my son's back. Now I can get the barn built. <laughs> he said, my son's back. Put the best robe on it. Put the ring on his finger. That's like daddy's credit card because that's how they would do the buying and selling. You've got your daddy's ring. You can take it down to the general store and buy whatever you want because you got your daddy's seal on that ring. Put the best shoes on it. Let's have a party. I want to celebrate. It's not like, yeah, you came back. See, I told you it wouldn't work so good. He's rubbing your nose in it. Do you understand? How many times do you go before God and you try to envision a future and, and all that you're trying to envision the future with, there's these emotional, mental drags about your past that is, it, that is putting at weights and anchors and stop signs on what you can envision about your future. Be, not because not practical things out here on the world, but because you believe that God does not have a, a, a good future for you because He's holding your past against you. Do you understand that? 
Sometimes we, we, we reinterpret the way our parents acted and the way the world might hold stuff against us. And that could be true. Listen, I mean, uh, people do people stuff and sometimes it don't make sense and reflect what God really wants. But oftentimes, how close can you be to God? How much can God use you? Let's put it in those kind of terms. What can God do through you? And your thoughts can be, well, after the way I live, blah, 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 blah. That's not the where to start. You know what God says? The you that did that living that you feel shame about, that you want to be free from, He's not trying to fix you up, that, that you up with Jesus. You know what He did with that, that you that you want to be free from? He did something really wonderful. He said, you're free. You know how you got free? He just took you out back and... <laughs> Why? We've been crucified with Christ. Not because He wanted to be rid of you, but because that you is not holding you back. You were crucified with Christ, but you were also raised with Jesus Christ. He raised you from the dead spotless and brand new. And that's important that you understand that. He loved you so much that while you were still a sinner, He took you into His arms. And when He died on the cross, He died your death on your behalf. Why? So you don't have to carry that around anymore. Because He's not carrying that around anymore. He died and it's over once for all. He's not saying, hey, well, let's look and see how bad you've been to see how, how much I can love you and how close you can, can become and how much I can use you. The Apostle Paul, I mean, come on, guys. He, he screwed up pretty bad, don't you think? I mean, he was murdering people just for believing in Jesus. I mean, some of y'all might have done some really screwy stuff. Anybody hate Jesus so much that you were murdering people just because they believed in Jesus? Okay. Well then, we can say that nobody in here was as bad of a sinner as Paul. Nobody had had, had deserved to, for God to hold something against them so much as Paul. I mean, think of it. Paul's going to be in heaven with people he murdered. And he's going to be there with no shame. No blame. No guilt. And I want to let you know, he got there with no shame, no blame, no guilt long before he laid his body down. When he came to Christ, he said he discovered something. The old me's gone. <laughs> the guy that killed all the people's gone. God doesn't look at me that way no more. I was a flopping fish outside of Christ. And that fish is dead and now I'm in, the, in Christ. I'm carrying Christ around inside of me now. Is that encouraging to anybody? That's good to know. You may have a hard time feeling it. You may have a hard time believing it. But I just want to let you know something. You need to give up what you feel. You need to give up what you believe and believe what God believes and feel what God feels. Is that okay? You just can't stop being so obsessed with what you believe and what you feel. Okay? Just give it up. Give it up for Lent. You want to be religious about it? <laughs> give me 40 days. Say, God, I'm giving up what I believe and what I feel for Lent. How about I just start believing what you believe? Is it okay if, God, if you see from God's Word? Listen, this is the way I feel about you. I like the way people are saying that now. You feel me? You know? Because really they're, they're, saying, they're saying it right. Because if you don't believe and get what people are saying enough to actually feel what they're feeling, then you haven't really gotten it. That's right. The way that you need to, to connect over the thing. 
And Jesus is like that. Jesus is God coming. He was in Christ. Do you understand? A lot of times we hear the gospel, you know, the Father's really angry because of all our sin, and Jesus, the Son, He throws Himself, oh, Father, punish me instead. And we think, you know, it's really hard to connect with, with the schizophrenic God. you got a part of Him wanting to kill you, you got a part of Him wanting to save you. And you're like, okay, which God am I dealing with today? Because <laughs> i got part of me wanting to, to kill me, and i got part of me wanting to love me, and, you know? So we need some stability. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. The Father was in the Son hanging on the cross. 2 Corinthians, in this passage we're going to be digging into, says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. He did not create the world. I mean, imagine this. You're Almighty God. You're the all. You create the heavens and you move into it. And all the angels can see your glory. You create the visibles, right? And you think, okay, that is going to be a place that's separate from me. No. How am I going to display my glory? How am I going to inhabit there and live there? His answer was us, that we are His habitation. And He is our habitation. We do not live separate. That was not what He created us for. But we were born separate. And God is buying us back. Bringing us back. So that He can live inside of us. And so that instead of living by our perceptions, and our memory, and our thoughts, and our feelings, God, when we open up our hearts to Him, and His Word by faith, that by the Holy Spirit... That instead of just believing that we're in Christ, we can actually begin to perceive what God perceives. You're inside of my Son. My Son is inside of you. I created you and predestined you for glory. Really. God did not create us. Hey, let's create man in our image and our likeness and and then be kind of average. So, so God is glorious. And I don't mean a physical specimen like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, you know, some supermodel. I mean glorious like Jesus. Someone who loves so powerfully. Who just is so at peace. Someone who can live with 12 numbskulls for three years and stand up in public and say, if anyone can accuse me of a sin, just let me know. You know, who at the end of his ministry with three, with 12 numbskulls, and they're still fighting at the table about who's the greatest. The same thing they've been fighting about all over the time. Because men just want to find out, well, who's in charge around here? You know, because every man wants to be, you know, hey, bud, you got to answer to me. You know, Jesus said, I'm in charge. You listen up. You know, I mean, everybody wants to be the boss. Nobody wants to be, you know, the, the, the gopher. Jesus is gone. Shut up and listen. <laughs> I mean, that's the way they were thinking. And Jesus is living amongst them and washes their feet. The Lord of glory. Even as the resurrected Lord. This is my favorite. You know, there's lots of fish in the Bible. There's Jonah's fish and there's the fish that, you know, fill the nets and all that stuff. My favorite fish in the Bible are the fish that the resurrected Jesus was cooking on the shore after He was resurrected from the dead and His disciples were out fishing. Remember in John that Peter swam to the shore? I mean, can you imagine having the President of the United States come and live and spend the night at your house? Probably not. <laughs> or another politician that you like. Or a rock star. <laughs> right? Justin Bieber. Somebody else, you know, like that. That you really love. And coming to spend the night at your house. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to throw you into conviction. You must be a believer over there. <laughs> That's alright. 
But can you imagine that? And you wake up in the morning, and they're cooking you breakfast. I mean, the the Lord of glory is still a humble servant. It's just his nature. It's just his nature. He's not an insecure person. He's really pouring himself out to love other people. And I love that about him. And I love the fact that he moves into you and me and sets us free from all our hang-ups and all our insecurities and said, you know what, all these people that don't know who I am and don't respect me for what I got and all that kind of stuff, I'm just totally not basing my life on, on, on what they've got in their mind. You know, other people's mind is a terrible place to place your happiness. That's right. It's a terrible place to place your significance. It's a terrible place to find your value. How about look upon the cross? If you want, because we tend to do that, don't we? We find our value in someone else's mind. We just got to get into the right mind. Uh, the value, the, the place, the environment that you were created to dwell in is in Christ. And let me tell you, in Christ, let me declare your value to you. If I have, I've got a, I've got a Kia Optima out there. It's got over a hundred thousand miles on it. I bet if I told it, I'd get a check for five dollars in the mail. <laughs> okay. So if I, if I wreck my car. And I take, get, it gets towed into the to the fix it up station, and they tell me, I'm sorry, you know, they they don't make these parts anymore. We're gonna have to comb through all these books, and we looked in all these antique stores, and it's gonna cost you a hundred thousand dollars to get your car fixed. You think I'm gonna pay a hundred thousand dollars to to fix up a car that's only worth maybe you know five bucks? <laughs> no, why am I not gonna do that? Because you don't pay more for something than what it's truly worth. You look upon the cross. And you look at what Almighty God says about your worth today. You don't sell yourself short anymore. No. Amen. You're not a fixer-upper. You're brand new. He didn't fix the old car. He paid to have that old car hauled away and to have a brand new car out of the old car. That's who you are. You know why? Because he looks good in that car. <laughs> He looks really good in you. He looks really good in you. And I want to let you know, he wants to put the top down. He wants to go about 90 miles an hour down the interstate with the radio blaring, with the sunglasses on, in a pink fuzzy dash, just the way it is. I'm telling you, he is ready to live life in you and through you. He purchased you to be his dwelling place. You are precious to him. And when you buy a car, you pay for the repairs. You pay for the maintenance. You pay for the upkeep. And I want to let you know that your physical bodies, your healing has been paid for. Jesus Christ, before He went to the cross, He went to the whipping post. And by His stripes, He was purchasing your healing. That's good news. Your body is not bad. Your body is not shameful. Your body's not a throwaway. Listen, you are going to get an immortal body 
when you die. And it doesn't need to be healed. <coughs> so all these verses in the Bible that talk about getting healed are not talking about, well, when I die, see, they got the ultimate healing. You know what? That is an ultimate healing, but that's not really what them verses are, are talking about. That's immortality. Psalm 103, verse 3 says, He forgives all of our iniquity and heals all of our diseases. That's good news. I want to let you know. Are your iniquities forgiven now or when you die? Now. now. Are your diseases healed now or when you die? Now. Are there any diseases to heal on the other side? No. There ain't no diseases over there. Hey. So that's good news. That gives hope to those of you that are struggling with some diseases. Some of y'all might have got some diseases and you think, man, I deserve these because of the life I lived. I want to let you know. Listen, that, that you that was living that life, listen, if your iniquities are forgiven, you think that God wants the consequences of those iniquities living in your body? That's good news. That's good news. So I want to let you know if you're here and you need healing, we want to pray for you. We want to agree with God that you're precious, not only in your soul, but in all of your whole being, your body as well. So if you're here and you need healing, I want to invite you to receive prayer. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be skeptical. Listen, it'll either happen or it won't. If it don't happen, guess whose fault that is? That'll be mine or whoever prays for you. We'll let mine or, mine or Steve or somebody else. No, it really is not our fault, okay? But what we're saying, we'll take responsibility. Don't worry too hard about whether you have enough faith to get yourself healed. Listen, if you had enough faith to get yourself healed, then you wouldn't need me. Right, my job is to help you have enough faith so that you can get healed. But listen, even if you... Uh, need someone else to pray for you, there is no shame in that. It's not like, I got no faith. I don't need you. You know, it's not like a macho thing. Okay? It's not a macho thing. I get other people to pray for me sometimes. But I'm hitting stuff. It's kind of hard to really believe sometimes when you got pain and stuff going on in your body. But God put us in an, in an environment. That environment's in Christ. We recognize one another. And Christ is in Him and in you. Okay? So there's other people here that are, that are willing to pray for you. So just relax and let Dr. Jesus take care of you. Okay? If you're here tonight and you're like, man, I'm listening to what that guy said. And I've been kind of on the fence because I've been afraid to commit my life to Christ because I've been wondering if I if I commit, you know, maybe I'm going to screw up. Maybe I'm not strong enough to really follow. So I've been kind of hanging back. Listen. Let... Let the great physician take you from being a flock of fish trying hard to get strong enough to swim on the land. Don't do that. Let God put you in the environment that you were created to live in spiritually. Let Him place you into Jesus Christ. You've got to be willing to leave life apart from Christ. If you're, but if you're willing to say, God, would you take me? Take me out of all that I am apart from you. Make me brand new. He will do that. He really will. And you'll find life comes into you. He, and, it's, and He makes all things new. Don't try to get strong enough to live a new life until you've been put in Christ. If any man is in Christ... He's a new creation. You can't live a new creation. You can't be a strong enough old creation to not need Jesus. You need Jesus, period. So I want to invite you, if you're here tonight and don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then hold him back. I want to encourage you. Would you just open up your heart and say, Yes, Lord, take me. Receive me because I receive you. I trust you. Put me in your son. Put your son in me. Make me brand new. Make me a new creation. Just say yes.
yes, Lord, that's what I want. Just right where you're at. I don't have to lead you in no special prayer. Just say, yes, God, I want that. Please do that. I'll, and you know what? Just take him at his word. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, you're Lord. You're the Lord of my life. You're able to make me in. So if you're here tonight, you want prayer uh, for anything, I invite you just to, to come forward. There's a few people here that have come in. There's a there's a life team that meets here in the area. There's others that, uh, that minister healing. I know Pastor Steve and Robin, uh, Brother Simon, others. If you want to come forward, and, you know those that want to minister tonight, uh, come on forward. And uh, yeah, come on. We need some Robin. We need a, a female up here. I think. You don't mind, sister. Um, Simeon, you're welcome to come forward. That's my son, by the way, in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> he, he was here six months ago. He might have grown a little bit. Y'all recognize him at all? <laughs> Anybody here that needs uh, healing, prayer for healing in any way, y'all just come forward, and I just uh, want to invite the rest of you just to just to agree uh, where you're at, and, uh, and we'll be happy to pray, folks. We won't make a big show of it. We don't want to embarrass anybody. We just want you to receive what you what you need from God. Okay. Yeah, I'm alive, uh -huh. feeling good, yeah. alright. You can take my joy, cause the world didn't give it to me. You can take my joy.